Grammy award-winning country music artist Dwight Yoakam is one of the most influential singer-songwriters of his generation. He burst onto the scene in 1984 with a brand of music that was true to the honky-tonk roots of country and influenced by artists like Hank Williams and Buck Owens. Now in what Newsweek magazine called an image-breaking performance, Yoakam has turned to acting. He is earning strong reviews for his performance as an abusive alcoholic in the film Sling Blade. I'm pleased to have him on this broadcast this evening. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. To be here. As you reminded me when you sat down a long time ago yeah. on a CBS overnight broadcast Beer called Nightwatch via Satellite, yeah. you stole one of my mugs. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm, it's great to have Different you here. Logo. This, one's, yeah. this one's logo less. Yes, that's right. Well, we're, we'll good. get there one day. We'll have one of these logos. When, um, acting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you had this stuff in the back of your mind for a while, or just I did it. Well, it was, yeah. I, I actually, the first real working band that I ever was able to form and, and, and um, perform with uh, was an outgrowth of a high school theater program that I was in. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, instrumental music department, uh, biannually would do a variety show. Uh, every other spring instead of a spring musical. And I was involved heavily in the theater department. And this, this gentleman, Charles Lewis, who ran the uh, theater department at Northland High School, was very um, uh, influential in my life as a performer. He demanded an enormous amount of professionalism. And well, we weren't doing anything that was necessarily heady in terms of the, of the, of the material. But he, he ran a summer stock company. Yeah. So he brought that kind of ethic you know, to to that high school program, and in this particular show, uh, a bunch of the guys from stage band said they wanted to do some uh, kind of a rockabilly thing. This was probably '72, and the nostalgia had kicked for the late '50s. And I had grown up listening to, uh, trying desperately to fit in, moving from Kentucky to Ohio, to uh, have an affinity to some kind of rock and roll music. You know, because what I listened to was bluegrass, mountain music, and my parents' music, uh, uh, you know, Stonewall Jackson, the early Johnny Cash stuff, and then Orbison, yeah. you know, the yeah. Everly's, all those things. Me too. But by the late 60s, had lost kind of a touchstone with anything. It was, so they asked, they heard I sang, and they said, you know, but this again was all alone and by myself at home. Nobody knew. And so I said, yeah, well, okay, well, I'll come in, because I played drums also at the time. We put this band together, uh, and it was a rockabilly act that I took uh, the last few years of my high school and toured, and one we played around town with, yeah. and played, and I later on went into clubs with. And I was doing Buddy Holly stuff, and that extension of that kind of hillbilly music that, that uh, connected uh, rock and roll, you know, to the young. Were you always at that time thinking about the roots and, and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm going to get back into this, this other thing? The acting? Yeah. I made a conscious decision. I, I went to California. I'd gone to Nashville for a time after I dropped out of Ohio State. I was a real checkered kind of past there, Ohio State. But I, uh, quarter school, I've been in a quarter, out of quarter. And I left, went to Nashville and didn't find an environment at the time, probably 1976, 77, that was conducive to what I felt would allow me to evolve as a, as a writer. I'd written, but not a lot at that point. I was just trying to, groping around, trying to, to, to define myself. And it was suggested that California and L.A. Uh, in particular might have an environment in terms of live performance that would be conducive to me doing this kind of, to them at the time, country rock. Now, it was, had elements of that real bass mountain music and bluegrass. And I was still toying with, I did, I did a couple of plays uh, in, in uh, a playhouse after I got to California, still wanting to perform, to express myself that way. But I realized very quickly that you don't control your own destiny at all as, as an actor. Uh, you know, just on the street, you know, begging agents to talk to you and 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 you know, handing out pictures. And I decided after after the play, I'd, I did a play in '78 in Long Beach, the Long Beach Playhouse, that I controlled my destiny with my music to, to what degree that we can. So I focused solely on that. Then at 20, I think it was 20 or 21 by that point, I, I just 
Mm. You know, and I thought that if I succeed as a performer, expressing myself musically, that there may be an opportunity to at least do theater again, uh, which which I didn't. I, I did uh, for the first time three years ago. I did a play in L.A. at the Met Theater, directed by Peter Fonda and co-starring. Uh, uh, Sally Kirkland, and a southern piece called uh, Southern Raptures, kind of Southern Gothic. How did you get to Sling Blade? Hmm. Actually, through music. Because Billy Bob Thornton, who wrote.